All right, we are all here. Welcome back from the break, everyone. Uh, we hope you had a, a good, interesting discussion and exchanges in your session. So uh, for this feedback plenary, we will pass the word back to Auza Thank to find out now. more about, yes? Thank you. Yeah, yeah, equally, I hope you've all had very good sessions. I was cruising between them and I heard some very important dialogue in all of them. We now move on to the last but very important part of our seminars. Each presenter will now give us a very short report, just the essence of the dialogue, maximum three minutes from all the workshop. And then we will have a Q&A with all of you that are with us, both those in the Zoom room and also those that are following the live stream. So I'm going to give the word first to Daphne Tepper, director of Uni Europa, who will speak on behalf of the group on working conditions. Thank you very much. Um, hello, everyone. Um, we had indeed a very good discussion, I believe, very dense and very sometimes intense discussion, um, and rightly so, about the working conditions of artists and cultural professionals across Europe. Um, we had um, we heard from uh, many different perspectives. We first had um, a very nice video uh, recordings of an uh, artist, a dancer, a choreographer, a dramaturg, a wardrobe manager, and an actor from different European countries who gave us um, uh, um, an insight about their life as uh, professionals in the sector, highlighting uh, what their challenges, but also some of, of course, the many positive aspects of working in the sector. Uh, and they also told us about what it was to go through the current crisis um, in their professional lives. And therefore, we heard about, of course, the uncertainty, the insecurities, the importance of contracts and protection and social securities, the differences from countries to countries uh, that appeared um, for the different people. Um, so it was a very nice introduction with uh, real voices of people um, in the theaters across Europe and going through this crisis. After that, we had a, a round table with uh, colleagues who are here um, um, from uh, ITM, from the Independent Performing Arts Organization, from uh, FIA, Pearl, and uh, from the Commission, from um, DG uh, Education and Culture, uh, in order to try to draw um, uh, um, the picture about the working conditions, what are the specific features and uh, what are the key challenges today, yesterday, tomorrow, and what should be urgently um, um, worked on. And of course, um, on the table were the, the, um, the issues of the discontinuities of careers in our sectors, of the increasingly uh, freelance workforce, uh, the importance of a contract, as I said, the sometimes very uh, low pay situation for many people, the, the, the very precarious safety net, the precarity of the careers and the impact this has on the art, on the diversity in the art and in the workforce, and also on the livelihood of, uh, of many people. Of, uh, uh, unfortunately, more and more people in the sector, especially in the current crisis. And then we had a third um, round table where we had the chance to have with us two representatives of the European Parliament um, and uh, two representatives of uh, member states uh, towards the EU. Um, where we discuss several initiatives that are actually in the pipelines in the different institutions on the topic of working conditions of uh, artists and cultural professionals. Um, and especially we discussed uh, suggestions, a proposal that was made in a resolution of the European Parliament on Cultural Recovery adopted in September to adopt a European framework 
on the working conditions on actors. And so there was a discussion on what would that cover. And of course, that led us to think and debate the competencies, you know, what can the EU actually do in this field, which is mainly a member states uh, competence, uh, but then also what about social rights and the social model that the, the EU is promoting. And so very interesting discussions, um, I think with a great recognition of the urgency of acting in order to uh, support the people now in the field that are going through very dark times. Um, um, but also the fact that those the precarity and was always there and this is also an opportunity to actually look long term and address issues that could be uh, changed and worked on in order to offer more security and a better uh, framework in the future. So thank in a you. thank you, Daphne. You you have gone well over your three minutes. Sorry for the short time, but we are pressed for time and we really want to give people opportunity to ask questions. So next up from group two, I invite Christoph Lepski from the Salzburg University to speak on behalf of the co-create group. You are muted, Christoph. Can thank you, thank you, sorry. Yeah, um, uh, yeah, thank you. I try to be very brief, um, uh, which is not uh, easy because it was a very dense uh, discussion that covered many aspects. Uh, it was a kind of journey from some historic perspectives on the need of uh, the co-creation and cooperation of, of uh, European universities to the actual situation to some future projects. Historic uh, perspective means that we had in the panel speakers actually explicitly from Eastern and Western Europe uh, from Poland, Budapest, and the Netherlands, and uh, from Hannover, of course, uh, the moderator. And uh, so they somehow first described somehow how and uh, uh, how they first uh, developed this kind of need, how they got to know about this, uh, about European cooperation. So it was uh, at this moment, uh, for uh, the Eastern European colleagues from a post-socialist uh, situation, uh, uh, having this kind of alienation experience when they first met Western colleagues and the difficulty to develop really equal partnerships. And I think this, that the motivation for all of them was quite clear that this is an issue uh, everybody, uh, all of them uh, wanted to develop. Actually, it was clear that this had uh, European cooperation has to be based on uh, the same set of European value, uh, uh, values, uh, uh, the autonomy of uh, universities and so on. Uh, we all know that. Um, and uh, how crucial in this context it is really experiencing different cultural contexts or in, on, the, on the level of the students, of students collaboration, how important it is. And there were a couple of examples uh, uh, experiencing each other. And especially, uh, of course, uh, regarding the situation uh, that was kind of highlighted that we have currently in the University for a Theater and Film in Budapest, where actually, and now coming to the describing the situation we are actually uh, in, so uh, where there is a kind of model uh, developed, that, uh, which is called the Free Republic of Learning, where the students uh, kind of in an extracurricular structure develop their own ways of working together, of cooperation and of transdisciplinary work. This can somehow be expanded on the international field of collaboration. So there were other examples of uh, cooperation uh, uh, works like the PLETA work, uh, Platform European Theatre uh, Academies, uh, which was founded a couple of years ago and where eight European academies actually work together and create collaboration projects where each academy is uh, participating in each of the projects the, uh, um, um, uh, the, the, the schools are developing. So I move quickly on to the models or to the proposals that were uh, brought up in the, in the discussion. So um, uh, there was one uh, proposal to uh, establish a kind of 
European production house for young professionals, which is addressed specifically for postgraduate students in order to bridge the gap between the end of the, uh, uh, of the studies and the beginning of the professional career, because there is the observation that now students or uh, graduates uh, kind of quickly get absorbed in the national institutions of the respective countries, whereas such an international European production house for postgraduates, for young experience, would be the possibility to open up a space to continue the, uh, the, the European collaboration work, which they experienced uh, in their studies. And this leads to an, uh, to an aspect that was quite intensively dis, uh, discussed, that there is now uh, international cooperation on a project base. There is, of course, international exchange on the base of the Erasmus program, but there is a lack of structural, uh, of the implementation of structural kind of um, uh, collaboration in the curriculum. This is for all partners a, a kind of a big issue, and it is uh, kind is addressed kind to the to the need for a specific European funding uh, for uh, this kind of structural implementation. Because uh, on the one hand, as I pointed out, Erasmus is too much for individual exchange, and uh, Creative Europe is covering uh, such a big field that uh, the specific kind of cooperation is not addressed. I just Thank you, Christoph. I'm going to have to stop you there. Sorry, you've gone over your time as well, and we need to move on to the third contributor. But before she starts, I want to ask you all to start thinking about potential questions you would like to pose to all the panelists and all the speakers here, and you can do so in the Q&A. So you can already start thinking. But last but not least, I give the word to Julia Dina Heze. Heze, is that correct? Uh, who is the vice president of ACET here in Germany, who will speak on behalf of the Access and Diversity Group. Yes, Go ahead. thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so I would try to sum up. We also had a very um, emotional sometimes discussion about the theme of accessibility and diversity. And um, we had uh, guests from different countries, starting with Yvette Hardy from South Africa, who would present an outer perspective on the European uh, culture and theater. And so she, she pointed out from the beginning that everything we are talking about today is not a one size fits all. So when we start talking about what can we do for access and more diversity, there won't be one solution as the landscape and the different companies and artists in their size and their constructions are so different on the one hand, and then the situation in every country as well is different as well. On, uh, at the same time, uh, it was a common sense that uh, one proposal and one very important need for the artists and the theater makers is to be supported in networking. So. Um, communication and um, exchanges, trainings, handing on first experiences, sharing best practice is a very important thing to, to uh, work against the getting bigger frustration in feeling that it is taking so much time for taking first steps that there are still the same people talking and sitting in these places that uh, this was another point and another claim that is very important to think about that it, it's not enough to uh, to make possible some projects and include and open up uh, minorities and making them minority but minorities by pointing out that you are doing it so it's more like a symbolic thing that all these projects don't lead anywhere so that the important thing is to think about privileges and to sharing power or giving away power and this is to this is what Yvette and Farnas pointed out you need to go outside in the street you need to make paths and uh, to open your access and to uh, not wait for people to come but to go into the rural areas go into the spaces and uh, create with the people not thinking that you're the one knowing the answers and knowing what is art and how it has to be done, but also rethinking our whole concept of who is the artist, who is the audience, what can we, can we learn from each other and truly make an authentic encounter of people in the audience, people on stage and people working in the theater. 
So these were some some of the things we had discussed. And um, of course, the theater is always um, testing for new new um, ways of societies and new ways of co uh, communities. And so um, the genuine interest is in interaction with the audiences and uh, not all processes have to take uh, on stage, but there is the question of representation. So there was the, still is the question who can tell which story and what stories are told at all, which stories make it to the theater and which people come here. And there we started thinking about the educational systems in the countries that you should also already in the school system start telling different stories and making access possible for all children coming from everywhere. And these children should see people and stories on stage that actually they can identify with. So there's a lot to do. And yeah, uh, I hear that. And there's a lot of <laughs> subjects already on the table. Thank you all reporters. I know it's a hard job to try to sum up on a two hour discussion with very many viewpoints. So thank you all for your um, good overview. Now, good people, we um, move on to the last part. We have approximately 23 minutes left for us to um, enable those that have been patiently listening to all of us this morning to ask questions or make comments or even better send suggestions of ideas of next steps because that is really what I think is probably highest on our minds how can we further the conversations and and take some actual concrete steps so um, the good forum team will be feeding me via a google doc um, any questions that are being posed? I don't see many questions coming in the Q and A. Um, is there uh, nobody that has any pressing things on his or her mind? I don't believe it. After all these important dialogues, I'm sure something is coming our way. But in the meantime, I wanted to uh, ask then, uh, ah, we have something coming here. So, just a second. So Ulrike Kunner puts this down. The European production house sounds a great idea, but it should be a satellite system in different countries and reflect the hybrid systems of artistic productions. So here's a comment that we have regarding the European production house. And then we have a question from the live stream, not posed to anyone in particular. So I guess whoever, one of you that wants to take this uh, question to us, put your hand up and I'll give you the word. The question is, what does the future look like for British actors and other theatre professionals in the EU? Will we lose access to opportunities, even if we speak other European languages? Who wants to take this question? Anybody? Dear Bell, we have um, Dear Bell Murphy. Go ahead. Uh, thank you, Asa. Yes, Dervil Murphy from the International Federation of Actors. And since it was actors who were specifically mentioned, I thought I would answer. I can only say that um, the acting community in Europe um, and with the support, I might add, of, of our employer counterparts, um, we have issued um, several calls to policymakers to please ensure that whatever the outcome, that um, the sector can continue to um, have the mobility that it thrives on. And I think it would be a terrible shame uh, if actors were to lose uh, opportunities in both directions to the UK and from the UK. And I can really only echo um, the statement already made and ask for consideration of the sector and the um, devastating impact that Brexit in particular would have on it. 
Thank you for that. And I echo that on behalf of the networks. I can say that all the European networks have no intention of cutting ties with any of their UK professionals, whatever sector they come from. And I believe we will find a way to keep on working with our colleagues in the United Kingdom. I feel certain of that. We have lots of things coming in, good people. So it's getting exciting. So in the live stream, uh, we have a comment. It is time for sanctions on a national European level to ensure that cultural institutions actually reflect the diversity of the audiences and communities in which they're based. That is an interesting provocation to say the least. What do you think? Should there be sanctions? Stefan, you've raised your hand. I just wanted to say that we turned it another way around. I never thought about sanctions, but maybe it's an interesting idea. But we thought about uh, including diversity in funding uh, as a criteria in funding programs. This might be the, let's say, the positive way of sanctions. Mm -hmm. Certainly, certainly. Anybody else that wants to respond to this sanction idea? If not, we move on to the next one. From the live stream also, we have really active people on the live stream, which is great. It would be good if we could know how many people are actually there taking part via the live stream. But it's a short and simple question. Are we listening to children and young people? Aceter, anybody from Aceter that wants to respond to this? Is Yvette still there? <laughs> what about Louise? Louise. Do you want to take the ball? Louise? Oh, Yvette is there. Yeah. Um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, child participation has been very much um, one of our focuses over the last couple of years. And we are, uh, there have been so many excellent projects which have allowed children to participate in the making of those projects. And now we're looking at how we can engage children in the policy making decisions and in the uh, in the sort of the way events are curated, for example. Um, so I think that um, Asitej is certainly paying a lot of attention to that as a as an area. And I think the next period that we're moving into now is it's going to be one of our main focus areas. Um, and we are building a, a collection of best practices from across the globe to kind of uh, use as a resource. Um, but I think we ha we have to. That's some, you know, and, and talking about diversity and inclusion, that's where it has to start. Absolutely. We've got to also think about. I saw it, um, and it's good to hear that you are really putting this in focus. But the question is perhaps also: Is it actually happening in reality on the national level? But I assume that is very diverse, depending on countries. It Stefan, is very you diverse, also want to respond? Definitely. I don't think, um, I think if we are talking about the theaters for young audiences, it is their DNA to, uh, to listen to children, uh, most of the theaters. Mm -hmm. My question would be, how can we transfer the, uh, the, the example of the theater for young audiences to the adult theaters? How can the adult theaters uh, better uh, listen to their audiences? Because sometimes a, a, a public theater does not know uh, uh, for who they are paying. So mm -hmm. I think the, 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 the best practice example of theatre for young audiences could be transferred to the, to the adult theatres and that might be a very interesting discussion. Thank you so much. We have to move on. There's a lot of questions coming my way. So from the Zoom room, Dana Rufolo asks, I would like to remind us all that the community of creative critics also needs to be represented. How can we editors of theater magazines contribute to the renaissance of European theater as, as there are people? Dana Ruf, sorry, I don't get this last thing. As, as, as a group of people, I imagine it, as theater of people. So can we, to make sure to invite the critics to our Zoom rooms. I think yes, right? I think we agree with this. We should just take this as a lesson. If we didn't do it this time, we certainly should do it next time. Absolutely. An important group for us working in the performing arts. 
Next from the live stream, stream. I think it is so important what Julia said about going out into places for the first time and bringing, bringing creative experiences to new audiences. Could this be advocacy for a larger scale, more experienced events? Can we link up as a sector to help each other create the widest possible reach? Anybody that wants to take this question on board? How can we help each other to get the widest possible? Stefan, I see your hand up. Anybody that wants to take it from Stefan because he's already come in quite often? Anybody? Okay, Stefan, go ahead. Sorry, but this was one point in the, in the diversity and access group, which was very crucial to say, uh, we, we have to be able to travel this is also made my uh, EU program, of course, to travel not only to the areas that are normally known, but to non-traditional spaces or to rural areas. And this there could, there could be a real EU program. International groups go to rural areas and to spaces which are not normally uh, um, um, supported by, by, by theaters and guest performances and by festivals. Yeah. This, this particular point is coming more and more on the agenda of IATM, I can tell you that. And it's something that we will be paying attention to. I move on as we are pressed for time. We have an anonymous comment from the Zoom room. We spoke of all the challenges this year has brought with it. This year has brought a lot of challenges. Can we think and reflect of any of the positive things this pandemic has brought with it. Elena Polvitseva and Ulike, next we have. Yeah, Go ahead. actually, it's a very interesting question, and we have been serving our membership about more or less the same uh, question. And it's still, we still need to process all the answers, but there are like incredible number of very interesting um, ideas about what is actually positive in this whole situation. Um, and some of them are um, as such. So first of all, I think many of our members have seen a huge solidarity in the sector, which has never been shown before. There is like a very interesting equalization happened when um, institutions could sit with artists at the same table and discuss uh, challenges all together, understanding the interdependencies between um, each other. Then uh, what is also positive is that um, funders uh, maybe learn something about and policymakers learned more about the situation of artists. It's obviously, and we have been repeating it all the time in our session about working conditions that um, it's a momentum actually to talk about the precarious working conditions which have been there already for ages, not only with COVID. And then um, another interesting, uh, of course, uh, there was also a moment to rethink a lot of practices, to reach out to other sectors, to think about more ecological, sustainable uh, recovery and the future. And then um, I think in many places, um, funders also showed a great flexibility. They allowed um, their beneficiaries to basically take the existing grant and adapt it to the situation, tailor it to the existing projects and processes in relation to what they can actually do and what they would like to do in these times. And I think that this practice of funders being flexible could be very much brought to the future uh, because if this is allowed, I think a lot of things and in inclusivity and working conditions, all these factors will also would improve in the sector. Thank you, Irena. Ulrike, you wanted to respond? Um, yes, I just want to add um, that uh, this is now the time, I guess, I mean, where we really uh, get awareness for uh, the artists and uh, that also politicians now do not only speak uh, with the funding institutions and just put their um, the money in front of the houses or in front of the doors of the houses, so to say. Sorry if I'm a little bit, uh, so it's, it's not confrontative, but this is what has happened until now. So uh, that the money just went a bit to the institutions as, as it was regular. And now it is like that uh, the view is much more open. So now also the politicians look at what is happening after the 
uh, after the doors of the of the institutions and what is going on then with the with the public money which is invested in all of these institutions and organizations and festivals and the and so on and so on and also we got much more public awareness so i'm for example more or less constantly in radio on radio on tv um, the media is really interested in what's going on so it's now really the 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 the, the time and the possibility uh, that all parts are now discussing and uh, really are aware that uh, the entire system needs to be renovated um, and that it cannot uh, we go on as it, uh, as it has happened now for 30 or 40 years. So and that we really have to look into all of the contracting systems, into all of the uh, employment systems, uh, in all of the security systems and so on. And it's quite a lot, I mean, but um, so far it's not possible anymore to close the, the eyes. Um, if we want to have a vital and vibrant and contemporary art scene, then we really, and all of the stakeholders, really have to uh, look on the conditions and have to see what are now the, the, the challenges that also in future we will have a very vital and vibrant uh, performing art scene. Thank you very much for this, Ulrika. I agree. The uh, attention towards the situation of the independent artist has certainly been drawn, and we need to keep hum hammering on that for sure, together. I have a totally different, very practical question coming from the Zoom room. Claire Howells is asking, when is the new application for Creative Europe gonna be launched? And uh, we know it's coming in 2021, but Regina wants to uh, respond to this or not. No, okay. Well, Barbara, you want to respond? Yeah, go ahead. Yes, well, we just received the good news yesterday that um, that there is a compromise proposal between the member states and the parliament on the Creative Europe budget, and it has been increased. But the problem is now we still need the endorsement of that. So there are still a few hurdles to take. But in any case, we are counting, uh, I mean, we're counting on the fact that it has been approved now, in part at least. So we're optimistic that the timetable that Asa mentioned that hopefully we will... Launch Early soon. part of 2021, can we say that? No, we cannot say anything at the moment because, <laughs> it, it, yeah, the budget is not yet approved, you know. It needs to I know, I know, but, you know, we are on our way, right? Of yeah. course, well, let's stay yeah. optimistic, it looks good. Good, 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 good. I have another question here in the chat and my iPod went off, sorry for that. Um, from the live stream. I am a national coordinator of a committee of the Ministry of Education in Italy. I'm involved in music. Do you think it's important to have a European point of view about education and performing arts? I think it's safely to say that that is what we've been discussing this morning, that it is important to have a European point of view. So I'm going to take the opportunity and say yes on behalf of all of us. However, we might differ on what is the importance and what should come first. Um, and then we have a final question and we only have a few minutes left. And that is also from the live stream. Does any country think about open, open call for theatrical science paper works? So I guess the question is about the sort of more academic research science part of theater. Um, is, there, um, is there somebody that would like to respond to this final question that we have? Ulrike? <laughs> uh, sorry, me again, yes. Um, uh, from our national perspectives and uh, the European Association of Independent Performing Arts gathers um, all of these national aspect, uh, perspectives. Um, it is much more about to open in general the funding structures and to allow every kind of artistic reflection. If it is an artistic production, if it is a research, if it is a um, theoretical um, approach or whatever, if, if it is digital, if it is live, whatever. So this is a, one of the main challenges, I guess, I mean, for the near future to uh, reformulate uh, the entire funding structures, national funding structures, and keep it as open as possible. Mm. And I would like to add to that, that this is also an opportunity, this question for those theater makers that are here in the room to think about the opportunities that they have as theater makers 
to apply for Horizon um, uh, funding programs and, and sort of more the ac academic side of the European grant system. Uh, we certainly are not excluded from that part of the system and theory makers could be thinking much more towards those funds as well as the ones that we maybe most of us know better. Well, I think we are going to finish well on time, dear people. This has been a good round. Thank you very much. I have a few uh, important things to um, say to you um, before we finalize. And that is that this is not at all finished. You can actually continue in the fun places in the um, uh, Dresden Theater because uh, there are these networking rooms available to all of you that um, feel like talking more and feel like contributing. And you can now go back to the um, 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 auditorium um, uh, website and find your way. If you want to talk about working conditions, you go to the rigging loft. If you want to talk about co-creation and international collaboration in education, you go to the stage. And if you want to talk about accessibility and diversity, you go to the bar. That's a good one. So rigging loft, stage, and the bar. I thank you on behalf of myself, on behalf of all the speakers, but I am going to give the word back to Ian and Dina, who are going to tell us about the afternoon sessions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Auza. At this point, we want to thank actually everybody for their attention during this very intense, dense and exciting morning of the European Theatre Forum 2020 European Performing Arts in Focus. Mm -hmm.